Welcome to the first of our 2023 Lunch and Learns. Um, I'm Deacon Kent Ferris, Director of Social Action and Catholic Charities here at the Diocese. Uh, the topic today is the continuation of a conversation on racism, and uh, we will begin in prayer. There is a resource that we will show, and then upon the, the finish of that resource viewing, I'll introduce uh, some guests that we have with us today that we've invited, um, not only for their insight on the broader uh, conversation, the topic of racism, but also on this particular resource. We'll begin in prayer as the U.S. bishops had concluded in prayer uh, with the resource from a few years ago, Open Wide Our Hearts. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Mary, friend and mother to all, through your Son, God has found a way to unite himself to every human being called to be one people, sisters and brothers to each other. We ask you for your help in calling on your son, seeking forgiveness for the times when we have failed to love and respect one another. We ask for your help in obtaining from your son the grace we need to overcome the evil of racism and to build a just society. We ask for your help in following your son so that prejudice and animosity will no longer infect our minds or hearts, but will be replaced with a love that respects the dignity of each person. Mother of the church, the spirit of your son, Jesus, warms our hearts. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Veggie Tales creator Phil Vischer, by way of his YouTube channel, Holy Post, presents today's resource titled Amer Race in America, Part One. And in a moment, if I can do as I need to do. I will do a share screen and we will watch the video. And then following that, we'll have comments uh, first from uh, select folks that have uh, taken the invitation to join us today. I want to say something about this video. It's called Holy Post, and it was created shortly after George Floyd was murdered. And there's cool. actually two parts. This is the first part. And and uh, by way of additional in introduction or the first of introductions, Nancy Stone is a member of our, our social action team, uh, fo both for our office and also actively involved in her parish. And so we will uh, hear from Nancy. But again, thank you for the, the uh, explanation, the background on the post. Our two guests today our father Rudy Juarez, ordained as a diocesan priest in 1980, served for many years as pastor at St. Patrick's Parish in Iowa City, and since 2020 has served as pastor at St. Anthony's Parish in downtown Davenport. Ryan Sadler is the Associate Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and reports to the Office, office of the President at St. Ambrose University. Additionally, Ryan is tasked with developing and communicating a collective understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion and its benefits across campus, diversity strategic plan, coordinating DEI training, and workshops for university employees and students. Um, one of the essential components is for Ryan to work with human resources, advancement, and admissions to recruit, retain, and promote a diverse workforce, student body, and donor an alumni base. Uh, Ryan, Father Rudy, thank you both for being with us today. A first question based on um, the resource, Phil Vischer's resource. And again, this is merely part one. It is accessible by way of YouTube, but based on uh, pastoral and administrative responsibilities that, that you have, what were your thoughts as you, as you heard or watched uh, Phil Vischer's part one? Who do you want to go first? Your mic's up, open, you go first, Father. Right, okay, well, <laughs> you know, you don't wanna think that, uh, that things like this are so um, strategically planned out or that they're so intentional, but obviously history teaches us that things were intentionally done with an intentional purpose, right? And it just goes so counter counter to what 
we are supposed to be about in our country, right? And so this, I think, is linked to, to a narrative, right? A narrative of uh, exclusion and racism that, is be, that has been institutionalized. And so, you, you know, when you grow up <clears throat> hearing, not hearing the real things of history, uh, we can buy into a false sense of what the American dream is supposedly all about, right? And some very good people that I know, you know, most, a lot of folks have grown up with this mythology of equal opportunity and uh, non-bias and non-racist things. Uh, along with uh, the sense that, as our guest on the video said, um, you know, what's the problem if uh, slavery was eradicated so many years ago? You know, and but the problem is, is that it became uh, channelized, channeled into other forms of the plantation mentality. And so, anyway, so. We, we have a lot of baggage that we carry uh, that we need to unpack, right? And unpacking it, it's like uh, like peeling an onion, right? So there's always a, another layer with every layer, there's a certain amount of grief and sadness and tears and anger and that, things that come with that. So anyway, that's we have a lot of work to do. And Ryan? Yeah. Uh, so, so first off, thank you for the invite and the opportunity to be here. I am. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm. I was pleased to hear that um, the conversation is still going on. Um, you know, it's it's something that, um, as he started off in this in his piece, we had a black president, right? And, and it's this it's this undertone that we get that we've had successes in certain areas, and they talk about athletes and so forth, and the how and when you're talking about the housing piece and entertainers. Um, I think sometimes we get lost in the extremes, um, and um, both on a national level, locally, um, and so in watching this again, I, you know, I've I've seen this video I don't know how many times, but um, in watching it again, I, I, I couldn't help but think about the extreme sometimes that we put too much um, weight on. Um, and we don't put extreme, well, some of us may be, but we shouldn't put extremes on, on events that happen in our lives. Um, um, and th those don't dictate how we function, they shouldn't at least. Um, looking back at the history of race and racism and, and is, for us to understand that race was used as a, as a term and frequently to identify groups of people with kinship or group connections before the 1500s. After the 1500s, it, it then became connected with, with this negative connotation or this, this, this connotation that we've, we're now using in, in the form this, this, this concept that we call racism. And so as a, as a world, we've we've functioned without that being a determining factor. It's not biological. Um, yet, as an, as America, as the United States, we have never been without race as a concept. And this misconception of it, this being some type of biological differences. Um, that, uh, that, that cause us to, to treat people different. Um, I've, I've seen the, the, the few of the chats here of, of you know, this video was of course posted after George Floyd and um, addressing, um, had a lot of addressing an African-American. I think in this community here, we can look back in, in our history and look at um, places like Cook's Point, Holy City, um, purpose of the second class citizen um, document and see that there was not just African-American, but Latino and Hispanic 
um, Americans in this community um, that were redlined, was restricted to living in certain areas, lied to by our by our city, uh, by our government officials. Um, and so some of the same factors kind of fall in place, but let's not get lost in the extremes. Those individuals who have done well, been able to do well. Um, you know, I grew up, you know, hearing this concept that as African-Americans, I'm, I'm a descendant of a sharecropper. My grandfather was a sharecropper. Um, and I have a story called on, on, on tape where he talks about it. So um, his, his last, particularly his last three years of trying to get out of it and how he could not. Um, and so he left Mississippi abruptly in the middle of the night. Um, he changed plantations. I call them plantations uh, where he was at um, once. And, and the guy told him that he couldn't, everything that he used to farm and live in, um, the wagon he used, the mule he used was didn't belong to him. Um, and so if he wanted to leave, he could leave, but he couldn't take anything with him but his him, himself. And um, so it's, it's I, I, and I say that to say we're not that far away. We're, we're not, we really aren't that far away from the effects of racism and the problems that racism has caused for us in society. Um, in watching this video today, I just thought in my head again, the work that I get to do, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, I can't help but wonder if race and racism were not, and, and, and not discluding the other aspects here, um, when it comes to diversity, if it weren't such a big deal, would I have a job? Would there even be a need for diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, you know, I, 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 we've created some huge problems as the video kind of really highlights in the housing, the, the criminal justice, um, didn't really, it got to, alluded to education, um, a number of other aspects that we've created because of racism. So those are my thoughts. <laughs> I muted myself because my dog is barking. Father Rudy, since the topic of Hispanics came up, would you please address how you believe Hispanics experience racism? Well, I I would say uh, growing up uh, here in Iowa that it, being an Hispanic in Iowa or in the, maybe just even the United States, um, it was always better to be Spanish than it was to be Mexican, right? Why was that? Well, the reason is because of uh, uh, your features, your outward features, uh, whether you were more indigenous or not. And there were there was a caste system even in Mexican American society as to who was better or who could fit in to the majority culture because it was based on how you looked. And so, um, which is, you know, underlying the whole concept of beauty, right? And what is, uh, what is considered good. Uh, qualities to have. But, um, you know, the other thing that I would address is that what was considered the source of shame, for instance, to have lived in Cook's Point or been relegated to Holy City, uh, for many of us is a source of pride. <laughs> um, you know, because you can only take so long, to, you can only hear so long that you're not good you're not uh, you're not welcome you're not uh, smart you're not whatever i mean you can only hear that so long before you begin to believe it of your uh, about yourself and so there's a certain amount of <clears throat> self-identity uh, negative self-identity that can take place and, and then if you have that on the on the majority uh, way of thinking in, in terms of the culture uh, all that becomes internalized. And so uh, how we ex experience racism is the notion that you are not as good as somebody else. And so 
that's 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 part of it and and so that's a reality and so much of much of my experience has always been overcoming that sort of uh, mentality not only in terms of of the people that you would encounter but also within yourself right so these are these are things that we as hispanics are faced with uh, day in and day out and uh, i was uh, at the gym just yesterday and uh, there's this there was this fellow that we were that i was talking to who was a white guy and uh, so he said well what's your name so i said well, my name is rudy he goes oh he said are, are, are you the taco guy <laughs> <laughs> and i go you know what no i'm not i said but uh i know who he was right and so because it was a local restaurateur who okay. who opened that place and his family also came from Cook's Point. And so anyway, but I, I had to laugh because I, I was going to come back and say, well, let's see, you're Tony, the guy from, you know, famous for, for being, being a cracker or something like that. But I, I didn't think of it quick enough and I didn't, you know, but I was at one point in time, I would have like been, I don't know, maybe insulted by that. But uh, but I was going to I should have told him I said well good thank you for typecasting right but anyway yeah so that those are some of the ways in which we as Hispanics experience racism and so and so I finally I think I've reached a point in my life where I don't uh, how would I say I, I take a backseat to nobody right. I'm very proud of who I am and I, I'm not, I, I, you know, I always figure, well, you know, that's your problem, not mine, right? It, and it will become my problem when my rights are violated, right? So anyway. Okay, for each of you, you know, you can take turns answering this. After looking at the video, how does the power structure in racism and systemic racism in the United States fit into laws and situations within our country? So, so, so how does the power structure, how does, say that again, how does the power structure of racism? Yes. How does it affect everything in our country? I, I personally well, believe that, and Sister Helen Prejean also thinks this, that the bottom line in this country is racism. Everything that is done in this country is decisions are made based on race. Well, yes. And so as, as the video kind of, as they alluded to, right, this, this aspect of, of uh, while redlining doesn't uh, exist in the same fashion, Jim Crow laws aren't, aren't, aren't still the, in effect, we have to realize the years of damage that it's done. If we if we understand, um, which I think all of us are of a better, a much better understanding today than than even five years ago of mental health, mental illness. Uh, if we think about this as a traumatic a trauma, um, the um, if we think of racism as as producing a traumatized nation, and when I say Producing trauma. You just told you that we talk about trauma more than just in the marginalized um, individual, but you think about the trauma that that comes. Even the fact of why it's so difficult to have this conversation, or why is it difficult to look into our ancestry and look at our family. Um, and, you know, I'm glad you brought up trauma because, mm -hmm. all right, um, I belong to St. Anthony's. Loxy belongs to St. Anthony's, and we have a monthly book club. And we're studying books on racial justice and um, not racial justice, but social justice. And in November, we had a book about Native Americans. Hmm. And we had um, Regina Tosi come and talk to us. And she mentioned generational trauma. Mm -hmm. And so do Blacks and Hispanics suffer from generational trauma just as oh, for sure. Native Americans for sure. 
Oh, for sure. I mean, there's a term that someone thought post-racial, um, post-traumatic racial um, syndrome or something, I forget what she called it. Um, for sure. And, and you heard Father Rudy talk about he made the decision that he's no, he's, he's, he's going to go on and not, not anyone, um, I forget the exact words, but not anyone uh, shortchange him and he's, you know, he knows who he is. But if you think about being told for so, so many years and generations that you're nobody, you're never going to be anybody, um, you're less than, then at some point that's going to be in the mind. And so, so what we see is a perpetuation of that, um, that you have generations that now don't believe. And some that believe their only way out is through their athleticism or through the entertainment sector. And how sad is that to think that, that you have people who are willing to, um, it's, it, to me, it's no different than, um, than the sex trade, right? I mean, you have, you have people who, are, who have brought up in, a, in an environment we're selling their body is the only thing in their mind that they think they can make it and exist and live. How sad of a state is that? Um, and so, so yeah, so I think the trauma is real. I think we, we can't shortchange that. Um, I think there are still, you talked about the, from a, from a legal standpoint, there are some things that bias still plays a, a factor in because of our each of us, all, all of our, our educational background, um, what we've learned, um, whether intentional or unintentional, um, you know, the, the lack of the history that we have of, of uh, situations in this country. I mean, the, the, the jadedness of the history that has been presented to us um, all creates these biases that are within us. And so I think we act in ways that, um, that show sometimes our prejudice, that show our bias, um, whether we are aware of it or not, how we treat someone, how we look at someone. Um, those are all factors that I, I would imagine that we all face. Um, and as long as we are able to address them, I think we can move on. Um, it's when we fail to even listen to someone say, you offended me, I'll say, Nancy, you offended me when you said this, Nancy. Um, and if, if you can't accept that I was offended by something you said, that you had no intentions or understanding that you offended me, if we can't have dialogue after that, um, then uh, there's no way that we're going to move forward. I think that's where we've been so long in this country that uh, you hear that this was a racist act or this was um, something that someone did out of, out of a prejudice. And, we don't want to talk about it. It's one-sided. And so how do we, how do we talk about love <laughs> um, and not really get at those, those things that hurt the ones we say we love? You know, I think too, um, it, it goes directly to the question of dignity, the dignity mm -hmm. of, of, a, of a person, the innate dignity, uh, because we're created in God's image. But I remember one time uh, back in the 90s, uh, a sad experience that I had or a realization that I came to when I took my mom and my aunt to Texas near the town where they were born. And so we were driving along and I said, oh, let's stop at this uh, restaurant here. And they both turned to me and said, no, we can't. We don't want to go in there. I said, oh, why not? They said, because when we were growing up, we could never go into that place. And they could never go into that place because they were Mexican, Mexican-Americans. And to have, and, and the thing is, that, that just really hit home to me. I was like, what? You know, what I would have taken for granted that you just walk in and, and have a seat at the, at the counter or at the table, <laughs> they couldn't, they wouldn't. And they were, I could tell that they were hurt still by that. And so, yeah. So talk about, you know, we talk about trauma. Well, there's some trauma, you know, where, or to, I remember another time when in Bettendorf, uh, when I was a kid, uh, we were gonna stop by the, this gas station because supposedly they were giving out balloons and something else. And so we drive up and the guy wouldn't do that because he saw who was in the car. And so 
Mm. Incidents of what the uh, microaggression, micro racism, whatever you want to call it, that that occur, you know, and even now, like the other day, I went out to uh, the grocery store and um, it, little stuff. You notice, I was standing. There was a line, and so I was standing in the back of the line, and and they wouldn't open up another cash register. Well, they did finally come over and open up a cash the next door cash register. And there was a white lady, white gal. And she turned and she looked at me. I wasn't wearing my collar. She turned <laughs> and looked at me. And there was another person standing behind me who was a white guy. And so she said to, to him, oh, come on over here, I'll, I'll wait on you. And I was like, okay, well, I was nice in line, but you, you know, stuff like that, that you notice. Um, and I did afterwards, I was thinking, should I go up to her and say, hi, nice white lady, you didn't, <laughs> did you know this or what you just did? But, you know, who knows? Who knows? But the stuff like that, you know, little microaggressions that, that, that you experience. Um, yeah, anyway. Would you I wanted to add that. Sorry, yeah, I'll, um, I wanted to add something just like kind of from probably a young adult perspective. Um, and hopefully you can hear me. My daughter's here and I've yeah, got yeah. songs for her in the background. Um, but like one thing I've noticed is that like when, when a black person accomplishes something, like maybe they go to college, they, they get into like Harvard or something, or like you can think of, um, the actress that um, landed the role of Ariel in the live action Little Mermaid movie, you know, people start saying, oh, they only got in because of affirmative action or oh, they only got in because the producers were trying to be woke. And, and so I, what, what I see is that like, when people of color do achieve something, it's like the white people are there to say, well, but they didn't deserve it. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. Father Rudy, would you please, in your opinion, explain or tell us your thoughts on the problem that our national leaders cannot come to any kind of consensus on immigration and how much of this is racism. And what makes me think of the racism is Yes, there is a war in Ukraine, but the people from Ukraine were open, were welcome with open arms here. So how much of a role is racism? Well, I think it's a factor, right? It's a definite factor. Um, there's also other issues, I think, at hand with that. Um, you know, it's a matter of uh, cheap labor to continue the uh, status quo. Um, so I don't know. I, it's definitely part of the part of the equation, but not the whole equation, right? And so, as long as you have have those factors uh, at work, there's going to be this continued stalemate. You know, I don't know. You know, it, it, it's impossible to live in an imaginary world. But but if would the would the same factors still be present if the southern border was all white people. I don't know, you know. I think there was, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Pat Buchanan who talked about, said something about, or even it might have been Trump about Norwegians and kind of that whole dialogue. But anyway, I, don't, uh, I stray. <laughs> yeah, so I, de I definitely think it's a, it's, it's a factor, but it's not the total picture. While we have both uh, Father Rudy and Ryan with us, you both have leadership responsibilities uh, in a higher ed institution as well as, as in a parish. Um, uh, and there are other pastors on this call that m might be able to uh, associate or connect with your, your responsibilities, Father. But for the two of you, as, as you are, you have an audience, a captive audience of, of folks who are probably um, active in their particular parishes. Um, 
what is the next steps? We, we, we labeled this particular conversation to be continuing the conversation. What do, um, what do parishioners who, who don't have uh, leadership responsibilities, how are, are we to also uh, continue conversations? Well, I think one of the things that I learned in community organizing with uh, the Gamaliel Foundation, QCI and such is that we need to be intentional, right? And when, when I say being intentional, um, to develop uh, relationships uh, with other people who we might not otherwise uh, associate with or, or come into contact with, right? And so that means that you have to really want to be intentional to establish a relationship, right? And so that's, that's the first thing I would say. And so if you can, if you can be intentional, uh, that's, that's, that's always a good thing. Brian? Yeah, thanks for the question. And I love the word intentional. I, um, you know, S Sister Joan was, was uh, one that was uh, very, uh, tell me and be intentional about things and um i i really I, I love that 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 thought that concept i would say um don't think that this is relocated to the leaders in order to address the issues um father rudy used the term human dignity um if we lead by the fact that uh, the person next to us on the bus um, the, the, the person in the store that seems to not have everything together, w wherever you may be, that person still holds human dignity and worth. They have value as a human being, God-given and created in the image of God. Um, let's start there. And let's not only challenge ourselves, but find a way to challenge um, those we work with, our family members, when we hear something, um, say something. I've been I've been saying that for a few years. We 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 use that that language, um, in when when it comes to um, either sexual abuse or or the type of intimidation that we be given because of, of that. But let's use that when it comes to any forms of hatred, whether it's racism or whatever it may be. If you see something, if you hear something intervene, say, say something or do something. Um, and I think there are safe ways to do it and there are unsafe ways to do it, to be quite honest with you, um, uh, depending on the crowd you're in. Uh, but I, I think that is the, the step we take. Um, silence sometimes, many times has been said, silence is consent. And so my silence, when I hear um, people say something, whether I am the administrator in the room or just the other human being in the space, my silence sometimes may be consent. And I need to find a way to break my silence, not necessarily the silence in the room because the room is loud, but break my silence to show that I am not consenting with what is being said. Um, and so I think that that's, that would be my charge to everyone. You know, one thing I was thinking of uh, earlier uh, was that, you know, with the mess that we have in, in, in Congress right now, it's almost like this, this continual exclusiveness, excluding. It's a continual, well, I'm, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm better, I'm smarter, uh, and to the point that, you know, you continue to exclude everybody because not everybody is on the track that you're supposedly on, right? And we see this in, in, in our own church where the, the more the, you know, traditionalists, the not so traditionalists, so that you continue to, to, to reach this hierarchy of goodness or hierarchy of truth and hierarchy of acceptability to the point that uh, no one is able to meet up to that standard. 
And so I think that that's part of what's going on with our inability to get along with people and our inability to do any work together as long as we're in our camps and in as and in this continual exclusive excluding uh, of folks uh, that's just not going to help and it doesn't help the some of the strands of thoughts that we've heard I, I, I draw back to Ryan's comment about don't think that this is relegated to the leaders, you know, in the same way that pastors must get very frustrated at times with having the faithful live it. <laughs> it's like, quit looking at us or, you know, quit, quit. It's not, it's not ultimately and exclusively our responsibility as, as, as people of faith. As baptized believers, we have a responsibility to uh, to live it, and um, and I also, I, I the the intentionality of being in relationship is is incredibly valuable. It's critical. It's it's the encounter, and and to uphold the the other person's dignity when approaching that, I think is goes a long way in coming back around to another thing that Ryan had referenced, which is um, confronting the forms of hatred and doing so in a safe way when the inherent human dignity of the other person can be uh, acknowledged out of, out of the gates. I, I do want to do a couple of quick commercials or, or the things that our, response, our office is responsible for as part of a bishop's staff. And those are not only resources that are available, but examples of parishes that have actually had courageous conversations. And again, I'm, I'm ever so grateful for Nancy bringing this up as, as a possible topic. I'm also incredibly grateful that she comes with potential speakers that we can draw from and, and draw us in for an hour over lunch. In our library at the office, we have a myriad of resources. Uh, one is an example of where uh, racial and environmental justice uh, cross over and a bit of a crossover episode. The, the video is titled, Come Hell or High Water, Water, Come Hell or High Water, The Battle for Turkey Creek. And the subtopic, or it says, when the graves of former slaves are bulldozed in Mississippi, a native son returns to protect the community they settled, a place now threatened by urban sprawl, hurricanes, and unprecedented man-made disaster. So there was a matter of historical racism on top of environmental degradation. Another resource that I, that's in our library is titled Racial Sobriety, and it's Becoming the Change You Want to See, written by a a priest who has also uh, received his PhD uh, and the founder of uh, the Institute for Recovery from Racism, a 2007 resource. More recently, there's a, a title by way of liturgical press written by Allison Benders, Recollecting America's Original Sin, A Pilgrimage of Race and Grace. So in the same way that that Nancy and fellow parishioners have kind of reviewed possible resources, know that our brain collective might be able to help you with ones if you were so inclined. Lastly, the last uh, commercial of sorts is by way of the Ignatian Solidarity Network. And they reference a webinar titled Slavery, the Catholic Church, and Lessons for Today. Uh, it will uh, air live next Thursday, January 19th from 3 to 4 p.m. The beauty of these recordings, or the beauty of these events is they say that the webinar is open to parishioners, educators, and all who are interested in the topic. Mm -hmm. And over time, with these type of live events, this one included, they're recorded. So when you register, even if you can't make it at the specific time that it's live, you will be sent a copy of the recording. So um, I, I, I didn't put those resources in the chat box, but as we package this Lunch and Learn, we will uh, reference those to those who have attended. Okay, can I say something? Yes. 
I thought I attached something. I have sent this to you, Kent. Kent's doing this technology stuff for me. I don't know how to do it. I can do it in person, but I can't do it on technology. But I have a, a document that is about three pages of racism activities for, for parishioners and individuals. And I attached it, but Barb said she didn't see it. So somehow could you send it out? We will. Whatever you send, and if you need to send it to me by way of email hereafter, uh, Nancy will absolutely get it attached when we send a, a copy of the recording out. Okay, and a couple other things I want to mention. Um, you know, I mentioned that at St. Anthony's, we do a book study, and we don't just talk about race. We have talked about every single social justice topic you can imagine, and we have many more to go. But right now, we are reading Black Like Me. If you have never read it, I strongly suggest you read it, because when... We meet on Mondays and anybody is welcome to join us. We meet from six to 7.30. And when we met Monday, we were discussing, we don't think things have changed. We don't think things have changed very much at all. And I think a very good way for parishioners and other groups to talk about social justice topics in a safe way is through a book study. And Loxie can attest to that because of what we have done. And I mentioned the documentary 13th. The 13th Amendment says that, and it was mentioned in the, the video, that uh, no one can be held a slave. But there are so many Black people who are in prison under the guise of criminality. And I listed a bunch of books, but one of the books that I um have read that is listed on there is The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. And that is an excellent resource as far as the subtle Jim Crow laws that go on in this country. I have to go. Steve. Yes, we are, we are at the Thank top of the hour you. and um, stay tuned for the February Lunch and Learn. Uh, will be the, the topic will be Catholic Relief Services and the promotion of Rice Bowl. Um, again, thank you so much, both uh, Father Rudy and Ryan, for your time. Nancy, for the suggestion of the topic. Um, we will send out more information, and thank you very much.